ICOs, or initial coin offerings, became hugely popular during the 2017 crypto bull run, when many investors saw them as a path to easy financial gain. According to data from CoinSchedule, over a thousand ICOs raised more than $21 billion in 2018. However, the majority of projects did not survive the bear market, which underlined the highly risky nature of these investments. In fact, the majority of tokens lost most of their value, some of them proved vulnerable to security breaches while others turned out to be outright scams. Nowadays, the reputation of ICOs as investment tools is heavily damaged. We decided to look at three examples of last year's failed ICOs and ask the people behind the projects as well as ICO experts what exactly went wrong. Launched by Harvard dropouts Rory and Kieran O'Reilly, GEMS was designed to be a human task crowdsourcing protocol in which users could hire workers to perform microtasks. Microtasks are small tasks that require human judgment to be performed online, such as filling surveys or tagging pictures. We started kind of, I started kind of talking to them about GEMS probably in the fall of 2017. They're interested in kind of basically building like a more peer-to-peer -peer version of, of what kind of Amazon Mechanical Turk is. Um, which seemed interesting to me because the fees on Mechanical Turk are, are pretty high. GEMS aimed to challenge the leading platform in the field, Amazon Mechanical Turk, notorious for charging users with high fees and offering low wages. According to the white paper, the competitive advantage of GEMS consists of a mechanism that guarantees task completion and incentivizes workers' integrity with minimal transaction fees. I just kind of started talking to them about, like, well, how would you actually build this on Ethereum? in a way where you know it was scalable and you could actually uh, have people do lots of tasks without running into the kind of throughput limitations of Ethereum. In order to enter the GEMS whitelist, investors were asked to perform a proof of care, which consisted of promoting the project on social media. Just prior to the ICO, the amount of hype surrounding it was huge, with the GEMS Telegram channel counting over 50,000 subscribers. However, things started going wrong when the company tried to maximize profits by conducting the ICO according to the Dutch auction model, with no fixed hard cap and bonuses given to investors who buy first. This triggered a negative reaction among the community, with many accusing the ICO of being a money grab. Eventually, Jams decided to cancel the public sale, opted to conduct a private one instead, and keeping 75% of the tokens for the team. As a result of the poorly conducted sale, in the following weeks, all the hype fizzled out and most of the community abandoned the project. On the marketing side, yeah, I mean, initially they, they did a really good job of <coughs> building, a, building a huge community. Um, and then I think kind of as both, both like as like excitement about ICOs kind of went away as the market went down, um, and then also the fact that the community kind of kind of participated in the sale, both those things kind of um, made a lot of the, the interest go away. Later on, GEMS was sued by allegedly infringing trademarks rights, and it eventually had to change its name into Expand. The token lost almost 100% of its value in the following months. The B token was launched by Binest, a peer-to-peer -peer home sharing platform based on the Ethereum blockchain that aims at becoming Airbnb's direct competitor. Its team was composed of people with experience at reputable tech companies such as Uber, Facebook and Google. Binest aimed to eliminate the middleman in the home sharing market. It promised no transaction fees on bookings through their site, while sustaining itself solely on the rising value of the B token supply. Supported by a passionate community, the B token was among the most oversubscribed ICOs of the year, with over 100,000 applying to the whitelist. The token price for the ICO was fixed at 0.14 US dollar. However, the enthusiasm completely faded away when some hackers stole $400,000 from investors through a phishing scam. The phishing scam really killed our momentum, and I think that that really shows that security is number one. Um, so after you know you get you get enough funds or you get enough uh, hype or, or you're on the uptrend, you should definitely focus on security. It was a third party that was compromised, not us. But but you can imagine like just the amount of um, reputational damage that we took for even giving our information to third parties. Right after the phishing scam, many criticized the BTOKEN team for underplaying the incident and not communicating properly with the audience. It's very dangerous to communicate after any type of compromise, whether it's our fault or someone else's fault, because we don't want to really be admitting guilt, per se, in, in a public 
in a public way. Like our, our lawyers are very worried about like the fact that if we say like, oh, you know, a hack happened, it's like saying we got hacked when actually it was a third party that got hacked and we would have incur a lot more legal liability. But I think, I think uh, so, so, you know, they really warned us to just make sure we do one or two vague messages. But in retrospect, I think we really could have um, and should have probably taken a little bit of a legal risk there in order to protect our users better. Despite the ICO hard cap was reached with a total 5,000 either or $4.5 million as the sale closed, the token value quickly dropped in the following months and today is worth only a tiny fraction of its original value. As a consequence of the bear market, BTOKEN recently announced it will start charging small fees to its customers, thus losing its main competitive advantage over Airbnb. So we were on the uptrend and then the hack kind of like flattened us and then the bear market kind of killed us. And then the bear market kind of killed us. We realized that we really need to build a sustainable revenue model to survive this type of winter season as opposed to just like, hey, we're an Airbnb with no fees and we do charge a fee. We Instead of charging zero, we charge like half of Airbnb's fee, which is like, you know, 8% compared to 15, 20%. So in terms of the security, we've definitely locked things down. We've re realized not to really assume trust in any of our third parties. So we have a ton of different like filters and checks uh, going through any of our, you know, Google domain names. So basically like back then we had like one or two or three parties that could post on our behalf essentially um, because, you know, they, they, they send automated emails from, from our servers. Now all of them are like limited. Texas-based Aris Bank project dubbed itself the first decentralized banking platform. The white paper had promised traditional banking services such as FDIC insured bank accounts, Visa-linked debit and credit cards. Just a month after the public sale started, the US Security and Exchange Commission halted the ICO amidst fraud allegations. Eventually, it came out that the company had no partnership with Visa nor the authorization to offer FDIC insured accounts in fact, it even lacked a proper license to conduct banking activity in Texas. The ICO turned out to be an outright scam, which resulted in the theft of over $4 million. In December last year, Aris Bank executive Jared Rice was arrested by the FBI and then fined, together with his associate Stanley Ford, for a total of $2.7 million. The two were also banned from participating in digital security offerings. We asked Ali Madavi, ICO advisor and partner at Blockchain Founders Fund, to comment on the ICO. Aries Coin or Aries Bank, uh, you know, was I think one of the projects that really um, put, you know, uh, put put real challenges to this industry and really helped, uh, really damaged uh, the space. There was no real probing into, you know, what was this information legitimate? No one really asked for for contracts or really pushed for contracts. The community didn't push for, you know, evidence on whether or not this insurance was real, whether or not it was possible to get SEC insurance on this sort of thing, whether they had any sorts of licenses as you know, potential investors into the project, like you do have to do your due diligence, you do have to ask those questions. And if a company is not willing to listen to even a small investor putting in, let's say 100 bucks, and you know, they want to ask questions. And if the community is not answering that through, say, like, ask me anything, or through telegram, or, you know, any any other sort of uh, venue, like I think that already shows some red flags that it's not worth putting your hard-earned money into a project like this. What did we learn from the 2018 ICO experience? The speculative hype surrounding crypto was the main factor that led both investors and startups astray. Projects that focused solely on profits without paying attention to real-world application, security and communication were bound to fail. However, the crypto community seemed to have sobered up since then. Since most speculators were burned by the market and weak hands shaken out, 2019 could spell a new beginning for ICOs. Cointelegraph. Like, subscribe and hodl.